So hello everybody. On behalf of the organisers of the Roman Army School, I would like to welcome you to our, our lecture tonight. I'll introduce our guest lecturer in just a moment. Um, those of you who've been here before, you know who I am. I'm Susan, I'm the current chair of the Roman Army School. What we usually do with our lectures is I will hand over to the, the lecturer in just a moment and after the lecture is over, we will have a chance for questions and answers. Uh, if you look at your Zoom screens, at the bottom of the screen is a little box marked Q&A that has two conversation mark bubbles. If you type your questions into there during the lecture, I will read through them all. And depending on how much time we have at the end, I will ask as many as I can to our guest lecturer. So feel free to type away at any point during the lecture, but all questions will be asked afterwards. So our guest lecturer tonight is Marco Jelusek from the Albert Ludwigs University of Freiburg. Uh, Marco has studied lots and lots of things by the looks of it, beginning with pre and early history, Christian archaeology and Byzantine art history before he moved on into studying provincial Roman archaeology, which is, of course, what we're all interested in. So Marco is currently working on his doctorate thesis, which is a first time overall compilation and evaluation of all late antiquity shield depictions alongside and comparing with the Notitia Dignitatum, which brings us quite nicely onto tonight's lecture. So if Marco is ready, I will hand everything over to him. And thank you, Susan, for this nice introduction. I wish you all a good evening, and I hope everyone has already grabbed his drinks and popcorn for my lecture tonight. I have to say as first, thank you very much to the committee of the Roman Army School and especially to David Brees, who um, asked me to help this little lecture about my PhD project and the Notizia Dignitatum and especially the field depiction. Before we are starting with the Notizia Dignitatum, I thought it's as first really important to understand where this document or the several documents we are working today with, from which period or from which places they are coming. So, and here you see a little graphic or I could better say a timeline in which I trying to depict the development of the Notitia Dignitatum and especially the copies of this document we are working today. And as I think every one of you already knew before this lecture, the Romans during the whole period of the Roman Empire were really fascinated by lists of every stuff. It's, it's the organizing of the military or the supplying and all the things they try to fit in this. And from my point of view, the Notitia Dignitatum, and we will see this during this lecture, based on this list culture, I would call it, and goes back to this high ranking late Roman office system and state organizing system on which the Notitia Dignitatum based. So the document or the text we are working today goes back around the year 400 with starts in some, with starts in some list a couple of years before 400 and a couple of years after it in the 420s AD. And this document for which we do not know the correct purpose or the event, even what is the meaning of this special document. We have until today no notes what we should do with it or in what kind of event was it a gift or a teaching book for a young Roman emperor or something we do not know. And you see this in this little time frame, the little dots, because in this presumed transmission history of the Notizia Dignitatum, there's quite a lot unknown. Many people think quite a lot of things unknown, but if we are only going back on the documents and the history and this provenance we have for all the Notizia Dignitatum copies, there are quite a lot of things totally unknown, especially the transmission history. 
for example, and that is like our master story, everyone who's working about the Notitia Dignitatum would tell you, it's that the original late Roman codex, which we call today the Notitia Dignitatum, was as first copied in the Carolingian period because they had a special interest for a renaissance of the late Roman or especially for the Roman period to build uh, under Charlemagne a new Roman empire. And during this early middle ages, we have the Codex Berenzis about which I will tell you something later. Then presumably during the high middle ages, we have nearly new, not the evidence for copies of the Notitia Dignitatum or other manuscripts. For example, you see under the Codex Berenzis, there's a entry in Dresden because, and that is in many cases the case, that sometimes there are codexes mentioned in old papers or historical documents which are not any longer available. For example, a codex which looked from the point of view of a historian around the early 19th century, early, made in during the early Middle Ages was destroyed during the um, Second World War and the bombing of Dresden in 1945. Then we have a wave of manuscripts or copies during the late Middle Ages. For example, Frankfurt Leiden, there are only preserved several pages Oxford Paris, well-made manuscripts with also at some points gilded pages. Then Cambridge also only preserved in a couple of pages. And really fascinating uh, is a copy in from Trient because for this copy, the monks or the copyist decided to reproduce only the text of the Notitia Dignitatum without any depictions. No one of us would ever know that the Notitia Dignitatum were in during the late Roman period illustrated if the first copyist, copyist had done this kind of decision. Then we have during the early modern period, the last copies and then also the book printing starts and they also starting quite early to print the Notitia Dignitatum. And there is a special case with the Munich version one and two, which I will explain to you later on. And then in 1566, the Codex Spirensis, the Carolingian Codex disappears. And now we have only the copies which you can see were made during the late Middle Ages and the early modern period. And during, I call it the late modern period, we are still in it and hopefully with a better end. Starts in a wide way, the scientific discussion. And in Germany, they started also to produce editions with comments about the Notizia And really famous are the Böcking edition and later the Sieg edition. And really important is the last point in this timeline that is the digitalization. Because during the last century, if you want to work with the Notizia Dignitatum, you had to go to specific archives like Munich, Oxford, Paris, and other places. And now you can see all the copies of the Notizia Dignitatum online from your home. And that's a really fascinating case because now everyone can work with these documents and you can compare them to each other. But back to the start of the first copy, the so-called Codex Forensis, which we have to put in a really fascinating and also, um, how can I say it, in a specific world in the early Middle Ages, because I asking myself all the time, why did they copy the Notizia Dignitatum? It's not like a text written by Julius Caesar about the Gallic Wars or Amianus Marcellinus with his late Roman history. We're talking only about administrational lists with 
I don't want to call the lists some boring stuff because I work quite a lot about them, but um, they spend a huge time to illustrate every codex, to work with the text and store quite a lot of value inside the Notizedicken Karton. In which time, and I choose this little movie scene from the movie in the name of the rose, in under which circumstances they copied this state handbook or the slate Roman state handbook. The so-called Codex Berenzis includes 13 books, which you can see here on the left-hand side. I um, made not some changes, but I tried to make it a bit clear. There are, from my point of view, more known works inside the Codex Berenzis, like the Itinarium Antonini map handbook or Itinarium from the period of Caracalla, which is the first famous work with which the Codex Berenzis starts. And you can also see it here on the book cover. They called this Codex Berenzis Itinarium Antonin because it was the first important work inside this codex. And then there are also some other famous works inside this codex, like the Notitia in Provincia Scaliarum and the other ones with uh, bigger letters. And then we have also five ancient written sources which are only transmitted inside the Codex Berenzis, and that's the red one. And also the last one, the Notitia Technica. In which period, presumably already during the Carolingian period, all this ancient written works binded together is also totally unknown. But it seems to be that someone tried to put them all together and also with some kind of a system, because we have also like an educational state handbook inside the code, an other educational state handbook inside the Codex Berenzis called De Rebus Belizis. But the circumstances under which all these works are binded together are totally unknown. Why Codex Berenzis? The Codex Berenzis was a part of the cathedral library of the Cathedral chapter in Speyer, that is a city in Western Germany, close to Heidelberg in Rhineland Palatine. And you can see also here the cathedral of uh, Speyer. And for many years, the Codex Berenzis were copied in this uh, cathedral and was part of the library. And you could also order copies of the Codex Berenzis for your own private libraries or for other institutions. And during the first part of the 16th century, also the Count of Palatine of Heinrich ordered a copy of the Notizia di Quintapo. He was really famous for his collection of old written sources and uh, famous and richly illustrated books. And at first he tried to loan the copy of the Codex Berenzis, but in the cathedral chapter of Speyer, that was like a sign of alarm because um, Art Heinrich was also stealing books from other libraries. For example, several years before he sent his request to the cathedral chapter of Speyer, he plundered the whole uh, monastery of Lorge to take the whole library for his own private library. And that was known also in Spire. And they sent him a letter back and explained to him that the Codex Berenzis is in such a bad condition and he can't, they can't give him the original Codex, but they will send him a copy. And that is later the version Munich 1. But Ott Heinrich was really unsatisfied with this copy, which the copies from Spire sent it to him, because, and that is also for art historians, a really important point in art history. He explained in his second request that the figures should be painted like the old ones. And from the point of view of an art historian, it's one of the first moments in art history that you can talk or speak about the word copy. 
because someone like Art Heinrich was interested in the most trustful copy of the illustrations of the Carolingian Codex. So, and um, at first, that's the uh, manuscript Munich 1, that was already made 10 years before Ott Heinrich signed the request, and that looked like really in the Renaissance style. And then Ott Heinrich asked them to send their own copies to Spire, and he made some outlines, and perhaps later on he colored all the plates, and he copied only the illustrations and not for a second time the whole text. But the story didn't end it at this point because the stepson of Ott Heinrich, Albrecht II, he occupied and plundered Spire from the 21st to the 24th of August in 1552. And he wanted to do something good for his stepfather. And he plundered also the whole library of the cathedral chapter of Spire and put all the books or the whole library in wooden boxes and prepared them for the transport to his stepfather. But uh, there were already imperial troops in this um, situation on the way. I don't want to explain the whole story about, uh, about Albrecht II in this lecture, but the imperial troops were only several days far away from Spire and he had to, he had to hurry and go to the next place because he didn't want to have a battle close to Spire because he had not so many troops with him. But Ott Heinrich visited him during this time in Spire and it's a bit unknown, we do not know what is happening. Does Ott Heinrich took some books with, it? with him, sorry, or um, the book and the Codex, the Codex Berenzis is lost in another way, but several years later, we have two entries in the library uh, lists of Ott Heinrich, and we have two books which are mentioned in this private library lists of Ott Heinrich's library. And uh, one entry is the Codex, um, they are both called um, after the Itinarium Antonini, and the first one, includes the copy Munich 1 and Munich 2, and the second copy should be based on this list, the original Codex Berenzis. And that's in 1566, and that is the last time this original Carolingian Codex Berenzis is mentioned. And after this year, we have until today no other evidence where we could find or have a look for this Carolingian copy. So that's as, as first that was as far as the presumed transmission history, but from my point of view, it's one of the most important things if we try to deal with the copies which we are still have in several university libraries today or state libraries, that we should during the whole lecture keep in mind this transmission history. Then even if we would have the Carolingian copy inside the Codex Berenzis of the Notitia Dignitatum, we are today not any longer dealing with the original late Roman state, state handbook, which, which we are calling Notitia Dignitatum. We are working only with late medieval and early modern copies. That is a really important fact, which quite a lot of people do not understand, but please keep it in mind until the end of the lecture. So, and here is as first a little introduction of the Notitia Dignitatum. And the Notitia Dignitatum is called as many ancient written documents or texts after the first sentence of this document. And it's called Notitia Dignitatum Continent Omnam Tam Civilem Quam Militarium Dignitatum Utusque Imperii Occidentis Orientisque. That means like the list of offices from the civilian administration and the military administration of the West and the Eastern Empire. 
The manuscript is divided in an older western part, but starts with a more recent eastern part. And um, is divided, as I already mentioned, in administrative lists, offices, administrative structures, civil and military stuff, and mentioned 200 civil and military commanders, which means not the names of military commanders, but all the high ranking system the Roman state based on. And that is also really important. 1,000 unit names are transmitted with the Notita Dignitatum, 650 place names. And that is, from my point of view, the most fascinating thing that this codex is richly, illust richly illustrated and contains 284 field patterns with the respective unit. Here are the first pages of the Oxford copy of Synotica Dignitatum and also the start of this document. I already mentioned that you have 12 other ancient or late, some point late Roman texts in front of the Notitia Dignitatum inside the Codex Sperensis. But there are quite a lot of issues if we have a look on the illustrations. And I brought some examples here with me. For example, and that is a well-known uh, example, is the female personification of Palestine. You can see here the personification of Palestine, but normally in the Roman period, it would be like a female depiction of the personification and not a male one. And if we have a close look, that we everyone will see that at some point, and that should be also before the Cambridge copy were made, the illustrators or the copyist didn't understand this plate or figure of the personification of Palestine. And uh, you see, and it's this one you should also always keep in mind during this lecture, that the Munich II version, which Ott Heinrich gave in order for the second time because he was unsatisfied with Munich I, looks a bit more female as the other one. But for example, the personification of Campania, which is comparable with the personification of Palestine, looks female and it's, it's like a depiction as we would suggest it also in the Roman period. Then another example, here are the illustrated plates for the Eastern Fabrica plates, which show us some kind of military equipment which were produced in late Roman arms factories. And you see, if you have a look on every depiction, every copyist did at some point his own view or painted or brought in some kind of his own perspective. And it's even harder to deal with it because we do not have the Carolinian copy on which all these copies put with our knowledge today based on it. And even we do not have the late Roman copy. And also keep here in mind that Munich I is the copy that Ott Heinrich ordered from his own copyist Inspire and look at the difference of all other copies in comparison to the copy Munich II. And here, for example, the Western Capricci plates, they are, have a special case because if you have a look on the first printing, which were made in Basel, that uh, print in Basel, there all the artifacts from the paprika from the paprika plates are not any longer identifiable because you can't recognize any shields or weapons. The copyist only put some weapons and shields under the table, also with wheels and helmets, but you can't identify any stuff like you can do on the other plates. And that's just 
also a nice evidence that at some points the copyist not lost, but they not any longer focused on so many details the copyist before focused on. And here, especially this example I already explained with the fabricate plates from Oxford, Munich one, and then the last one uh, from Basel, which is not any longer comparable to the earlier copies. And then, and that is also some kind of stuff I recognized during the last years of my work, that quite a lot of people trying to work with the Notizia Dignitatum or use the Notizia Dignitatum and especially the illustration for your own stuff they're dealing with. That is from the scientific point of view, if you buy a book about the late Roman period, nearly every archaeologist and historian uses the illustrations of the Notizia Dignitatum only as, or I don't want to judge everyone, but um, in many cases only to illustrate their own book, but not, but does not work so much with the, all the questions we have to deal with the Notizia Dignitatum. And that is, for example, if we have a look on the reenactment or living history community, many people will, uh, many people identify a manica, which you can see here uh, on the bottom in a reconstruction made by Peter Connolly, also in the late Roman period, based on the fabrica plates you have in the Notizia Dignitatum. From my point of view, it's I call it as I see it as a desperate attempt to uh, identify it as a maniker in the late Roman army. But if you have a view on the other copies, as I already shown to you, there are so many other stuff which can't be identified inside the Scrapica plates. And it is even hard for me to see or identify what kind of stuff the copyist even we are not talking about the late Roman copyist or the first book painter who painted the original Notizia Dignitatum or the Arca Codex, but I don't see so much value in this kind of plates. For example, also Christian Wix, an archeologist in Germany, um, offered us the interpretation of this little pyramid, which you can see on the right hand side of uh, the green field. And he explained, uh, and that was not a bad attempt, I, in many points I, with his interpretations, that he explained in his book about uh, late Roman helmets that this, that this little pyramids could be a depiction of Roman field bosses which were fabricated in late Roman army factories. And we have only two late Roman field bosses with stamps and that's just one from a misery from the Departement Somme in France, which shows uh, presumably a fabric stamp, but not from a state factory, presumably from a little unit factory, which were also during the late Roman pe uh, period around the mobile unit forces and produced directly uh, weapons for, for their units. But also this shield boss and the other one are lost. We have only this one depiction from Misery. And no other shield bosses with this kind of stance. But that can be also the case that uh, we do have today only the iron parts of the shield bosses, not any longer the, the gilded or silvered uh, coverings of this like Roman shield bosses, which were um, ornamented uh, with this kind of fabric stance. Then I wanted to focus more on this two pages. I did it already with the first one, but now I want to show you only with one example, the text and this system of lists. And as first, this 
plates are not showing completely the stuff which were made in state weapon factories. The shields in the upper part are showing the shields of the scoli that are late Roman allied unit forces which were under the command of the Mag uh, Magistri Officiorum, you can see it here in this list. And But the order which scoli and which scoli is comparable to the shield on the page before, that is not possible. And then if we have a look on the fabrici, which are mentioned in the Notitia Dignitatum, I try to make it a bit more clear that the localizations or the geographical um, areas are marked with blue color. And the first one is uh, Uricum, the second one is Italy, and the third one is Gallia. And then the red ones are the mentioned places, and the green ones are the weapons which were factored in the state army weapon factories. And based on the high value of this document, these factories were never identified during an archaeological excavation. We have no archaeological evidence for this kind of factory. We have only some other written sources, like uh, some um, bad words written by Lactantius about the uh, Christian murderer Diocletian, Emperor Diocletian, in which he's explaining this, that Diocletian has uh, spent so much money for this factory uh, system. But uh, a clear list of all those factories only transmitted with the Notitia Dignitatum, and without this document, we would have the same knowledge about weapon making system as we have for the High Roman period. But for the late Roman period, we have this special document with this uh, list of fabrici, which can be also mapped and explains quite a lot about the system, which based for presumably on the experiences the Roman Empire made during the third century AD with all the civil wars, that you have nearly no province or deucing which can autonomic produce weapons and equip all armies. You have in every area uh, special fabrici which are producing shields, swords, spears, and uh, other armor uh, parts, yeah. And that's based only on the documents. I say it again, we do not have one evidence doing uh, archeological excavation for this kind of uh, factories in the Roman period. Only little factories which are linked to the Roman ports and literary fortresses, but not like this um, higher, system and large buildings uh, in which perhaps hundreds of people were producing weapons for the late Roman army. And now we are um, coming to the shield patterns in the Notitia Divinitatum, which are my main focus or my main topic also in my PhD, because they are also really special and there are for the whole Roman period, we have no other evidence for a document like this with field depictions linked to a specific unit and then in color in with which we can identify specific units. Because that is the first and the only moment we can we, we have such a document. And we do not know that similar documents exist in the time before the Notitia Dignitatum were made, but we can Presume it because all the system of shields would be somewhere in an archive in Rome or Constantinople collected. And that was for a long time, and also during my PhD, one of my main questions what is the meaning of all this late Roman shield emblems or shield patterns, not only inside the Notitia Dignitatum, then also uh, in 
thousands of Roman artworks. And during the years, I uh, try to make a large collection, or I can also call it a database, in which I try to collect all Roman shield depictions on wooden sculpture. That is only one example, which is this sculpture you can see here, which is now in the museum in Berlin. But then coins, silver artworks, ivory works, stone monuments, mosaics. I try to bring every late Roman artwork with shirts together, also with one of my main goals to identify a unit inside the late Roman artwork and to identify the shirt or compare it with the, with the, with the book paintings inside the Notizia di Picado. And I have to work with field depictions because there are only a few original fragments of late Roman shields which are um, uh, preserved until today. For example, this is three field fragments which are now in an unknown private collection and no one know where they are now, uh, where, where, where they are today. But they are published once in 1996. And this shield paintings show us, besides the shield paintings from Dura Europus in Syria, how richly painted late Roman shields could be. And that is also a thing we should keep in mind if we have now a more closer look on the shield patterns inside the different copies of the Notizia di Pintatum. One, and I think, uh, and I choose right for a long time this example, and I think uh, many people of you will now go Barker. I was wondering for a long time that no one tried this work before me. Only Phil Barker in his uh, table book, introduction book about uh, the armies and enemies of Imperial Rome, made a similar attempt because, and he did enormous work for 1981, because he made outlines, unfortunately in black and white, but that's based, I think, also on the um, missing of digital copies of the Notizia Dictatum. He made outlines of every field which is transmitted with, inside the Notizia Dictatum. And then he also tried to collect different shield patterns, patterns from other late Roman artworks and tried also in the first attempt to compare them to each other. And you can see his little collection of late Roman shields here on the left hand side. And for example, the last line is uh, from the Ark of Constantine and the Theodosius Missorium from Madrid, or the really famous uh, Monza diptych from the cathedral treasure of Monza. And this is also a thing I recognize that over the years, there were only a little group of people, and that is uh, living history and uh, Reed Eggman community, and also this uh, figurist painters you see on the right hand side. They uh, spend quite a lot of trust inside the shield patterns, which are transmitted in the various copies of the Metizia and use this document in a wide way. Also, there are some computer games uh, which are. Uh, use the uh, field patterns from the Notizia Dignitatum. And that is really fascinating because in the scientific discussion, no one had, after several decade, decades, a uh, close look on all the field patterns. And there was also the opinion that they are not any longer trustful. One famous comment on the Notizia field patterns is written by Robert Grigg. And he made this uh, really strong and bad comment on the shield patterns in which he explained the shield emblems instead seem to, hear, seem to have been largely ad hoc creations 
as is strongly implied by the pro progressive stereotyping and tolerance for runs of nearly identical emblems that is seen in the chapters of the Magister Militium. So he also expected that the main part of the shit illustrations inside the copies of the Notizia Dignitatum are invented by medieval copyists or not any longer linked to any late Roman field paintings. So here, for example, a second time, this original shape shield paintings, which show us how richly painted shields with a diameter of one meter could be painted. But we have in this point also again keep in mind that we are talking about reduced shield miniatures or shield patterns. For example, the shield patterns inside the bot lane copy of the Notizia Dignitatum at the University of Oxford. Their shield patterns have only a diameter of, I think, two or three, no, three uh, centimeters. And that means we're talking about highly reduced shield patterns, which are only have, which are only mirroring as some kind of late Roman shield painting, if I uh, say it in this way. But uh, if we, Keep in mind the original shield paintings, which are, which we have today. We should never see the Notitia shield patterns in a way we can put them one to one on an original or a reconstructed shield. For example, a good friend of mine, Janis Kernert, which is a graphic designer, he is making quite a lot of reconstructions for my PhD project, and he tried to make an hypothetical drawing of the shield you see on the left hand side based on the other shield paintings we have how presumably a late roman shield painting would look like also with a name of a specific soldier on it as uh, the military of the late roman military author regetius mentioned in his military handbook so and with this goal or this collection and database of late Roman shield depictions, as first I try to make a, a stammer of illustrations. That means I try to bring in order all the shield patterns from the various copies of the Notitia Dignitatum in one book. And I decided uh, with a uh, close uh, discussion with Ingo Meyer, who is working for decades on the Notitia Dignitatum, that um, this uh, way I explain now to you is, is a good way also to show everyone how to work with the shield patterns of the Notitia Dignitatum. And this first, uh, every page with shield patterns is in this definition a picture. And then we have a range, like which is uh, numbered from the first line until the last one. And then we have the field patterns, which are also numbered, that everyone can refine the specific field pattern, which is on my plate. Here's the localization, which you can see with picture, range, and the field pattern. And then which is also important for the forthcoming of later research, which will be perhaps um, based on my work, that uh, we have um, for quite a lot of units inside the Notizia Dignitatum a different spelling of the specific unit in the specific uh, copies of the Notizia Dignitatum. And uh, that will be also included in my catalog. And then, um, the citation scheme of Böcking and Sieg, that you can also work with the old um, editions. And then a section for notes and the commentary, which will explain the development or the evolution of the specific shield pattern inside the different copies. 
And it starts always with the Oxford copy, then comes the Paris, the Basel printing, the Vatican Munich 1 with M and Munich 2 with a W. Yeah, and then a, a, a number with, uh, with um, which uh, you can use it for your um, scientific work and for other publications. Yeah, and that is quite an enormous work. As you saw on the upper part of my slide, then we're talking about over uh, 1,700 field patterns. And also you see here, for example, the difference between only between the copy Munich 1, with which Ott Heinrich was totally unsatisfied because that shows more a Renaissance copy of the Carolinian copy. And on the right hand side, the second copy, which were made by the copyist sent to Spire by Ott Heinrich himself. And you see a difference because, um, and what a fascinating difference, because if we trust in the letters which were sent by Ott Heinrich to the monastery of Speyer, that um, the Munich II copy should be the most trustful copy because his copyist got the order from Ott Heinrich that they should be close as possible to the Carolinian copy. But um, there are also some mistakes in several copies, which are which will be also mentioned inside my catalog, and one of the famous mistakes, or which quite a lot of people try to find a solution about it, is for example this page. And if you have a look on the last line of the shield, you can see uh, on the left hand side that you have four shields in the last line, and on the right hand side in the last line you have five shields in the line, and I don't want to say that the copyist or the book painter made a mistake because we do not have any longer the Carolinian copy this copy is based on. So we do not know in what kind of condition this copy was and other cases that could be happening. The same page in the Vatican manuscript. You have the same system of shields, also the same units are mentioned. But you can see that the book painter had a problem to bring the shields in the right order. And as first he thought he has in every line five shields, and then he recognized that he has only in the last line five shields, and he even crossed the, the border or the window of his um, shield field. But without the Carolinian copy, I I do, I do not have an explanation for this kind of mistakes. But um, that is a similar case in the Paris uh, copy. And here you can see behind the painted shields the outline for four shields. And during a second attempt, he painted, as in the other copies, five shields inside this field. And you can see that every copyist had with the same page a problem to draw the shield pattern. And here my um, a picture of my catalog, in which you can see you have in nearly all copies this uh, shield, which is uh, the fifth uh, shield in the other copies, but only in Munich one, this shield is missing. But here, for example, a uh, shield uh, pattern from the Paris copy, in which you can see until today how much work this book painter spent on this singular shield because you can all you can see until today the outlines he made for this specific field pattern. So it was not a work that were done by a couple of hours. They spent some some time to paint all these shield patterns inside this codex. 
And now I'm showing you some examples from my catalog before I coming to a specific example and then also the end of my talk. Here, for example, you have uh, like a strict way of painted build patterns. But if you have a close look on every shield, you will recognize that the nimbus, which you can see around the head of the bird in O and P, is missing in B, Munich 1, and Munich 2. And that's a, this little details I focus on, then only at the end, and you have a view on all of this shields, you can judge or you can imagine how the Carolinian copy could look like. And here, for example, if you have a look on the little miniatures in the half moon and the upper part of the shield, you see O, P, quite similar. In B, the printer or the painter decided to put a T inside. V is quite similar. In Munich 1, you have a dot. And in Munich 2, you have a little heart. But please, also for the question one, don't ask me what is the meaning of all of it. That is the uh, other talk. Then here, the third pattern of the Zali E. You have this um, in O and P, but hard to see in the shield pattern P. You have a little dot with many dots around them. And then you have this little creatures with two arms without legs which are looking on this, I don't want to call it sun, but yeah. But uh, in B, we, Munich 1, Munich 2, there are no creatures on the shield, but we're talking about the same shield. Then, for example, the field pattern of the Zagitari is in Euris Gallicani. You have this winged people. We are not talking in this uh, time about angels. That's the reason why I'm saying winged people, which are looking on this little tabula. And then in B, they looking already like little birds. In V and the copy Munich 1, they are missing, missed. And then in the copy Munich 2, that's are already little birds, but that should be at the end from the letter in which Ott Heinrich ordered the second copy of the illustration, that should be the most trustful copy we have today. Then we have the third pattern of the Hiberi. O, P, B, it looked quite similar. And then also the V and the comp copy Munich 1. And uh, in the copy Munich 2, we have also a creature or a lion with a human face. And also the copyist didn't understand any longer during his period the functional or the technical depiction of a shield because the little circle inside the shield is not any longer a shield boss. It is now more a saddle for the uh, little creature inside the shield. And a similar case as we had before with the swing people is similar here. We have a little abula with uh, two people inside or two figures in O. In P, they are missing. B sees again a tabula and the swinged uh, little people. And then we have we, the mini copic one also with a other color scheme. And then we have two birds in the in Munich two. Or here, a funny example that also the copyist didn't understand during the late Middle Ages and the early modern period the, the depiction of a shield because the copies uh, O, P, B, V, Munich 1 and Munich 2 showing us not a shield boss, then more a tongue of this creature with one head which looks in our direction. And then 
Suffmittelexamen für Syphilitis Theodosiani. I do not have a definition or explanation for the first depiction of the shield, but during the later copies, it shows us more a sun. But sorry, uh, I forgot to say it. In the earlier period, during the late uh, Roman period, it could be also depicted a face of a Roman emperor. And in this case, the emperor uh, but, um, after the unit is named, uh, Theodosius, which could be depicted on the shield, also with a nimbus. But this is only an interpretation based on that, what you can see, and I uh, do not do so many interpretations in my PhD because you, you see there's there's not so much space to do it. And then also a funny example, the shield pattern of the Grati, which shows quite a long time from O to the copy Munich 1, this um, creatures with two arms, which looking each other in their face. And then uh, the last copy, which is done by the copyist, which sent it at Heinrich to Aspire, chose two rabbits. And also a famous uni, uh, which I presumably uh, raised here in the Breisgau, where my university is, the Brusigavi Juniores, which shows an O, like, look like a uh, sun, and then you have like here the uh, leaves from Frankfurt Leiden, which is only presumed uh, preserved in a bad condition because they used an uh, old copy of the Notizia Dictatum to bind a new book. This hat looks like Santa Claus, and then you have other field depictions which depict more an old man and the copy Muni 2 is also here a bit far away from the other copies. And then a similar case, as I already showed you, with this creature, presumably a lion or something else, which shows in the last version, again, a creature with four legs, a human face. And also the painter, again, didn't understand the um, a construction of a shield and shows us not any longer a shield horse and the mid part of the shield than more a saddle for a horse. And then also quite fascinating is uh, the case that we have inside the field patterns of the Notizia Dating Cartum for the Western world, the first depiction of, the, of a yin and yang sign. But what's the meaning about this? I can't tell you. And uh, yeah, we have even two shields inside the Notizia Dictatum, which show us not any longer a shield sign, only this cross. But we have a name which is referring to this uh, shield. But what has happened with this shield depictions where the Codex Forensis water damaged? or where the shield's missing or not any longer readable, we do not know. So, and now uh, before I come to the end of my talk, I want to show you a little example, uh, which based on my master thesis, which is also like the start for this whole topic about Roman shields. And, um, I know for someone who is attending this lecture, this is some old stuff because I already published it in German, but um, it's from my point of view and today such a important evidence for the for all the illustrations and signed the Notita Dignitatum that I showing you this uh, today again. Also for the people they didn't know until today is this little a discovery I made during my master thesis. And now we're going to Sicily um, and um, more um, to the eastern city in Sicily, Syracuse, where is the catacomb. 
And in this catacomb, there is this tomb of the late Roman soldier Flavius Maximianus, and which I will explain to you during the next slide. We're talking about Sicily during the late Roman period, and you see in the northern section of Sicily, this little cross, and this is the localization of the Villa Maria catacomb. This area is full with uh, funeral sites, as in close to every Roman city outside the city walls, there are the tombs and uh, cemeteries. And here, this red area is the Villa Maria catacomb. I'm showing you uh, this because uh, there are many confusing papers which are not identified the Villa Maria catacomb correctly. Someone um, explained that this fresco of Flavius Maximianus is inside the Villa Landolina catacomb. This would be three on the um, map. But the Villa Maria catacomb was um, discovered, and that's one of the last large catacombs which were discovered in Syracuse during the early 60s, during building, building constructions on the Hotel Teocrito, which is here number one. And also it's called afterwards uh, Villa Maria Catacomb because um, they also built this um, living house Villa Maria on some parts of the catacomb. And here's a map. I have made um, after the excavation documents and only uh, to localize uh, where we are inside the catacomb if we are talking about this tomb of Flavius Maximianus. We are in the southern basement floor and in the right corner you see this uh, tomb with the little lines that is the Arcosolium of Flavius Maximianus. And here a little black and white photo from the documentation report in 1964. And the last arcosolium you see in this floor, that is the arcosolium of Flavius Maximian. That is uh, an outline, uh, a little or a little drawing I have made. And here I covered the inscription and the shield because I wanted to show you step by step what I have done on this fresco and what is the spe special thing also linked to the Notizia di Quintato. And as first, I have to say that this uh, fresco was published in 1969 only with a black and white photo. And afterwards, it was, I think there's not one depiction of a late Roman soldier what was so many times published as this photograph made by Roger Wilson in 1973. And you will find nearly in every publication about the late Roman army, you will find a depiction of this uh, fresco made by Roger Wilson. Also, uh, Bishop and Colston in their famous uh, book about Roman military equipment and uh, in many other publications. But um, in many cases, this photography was only shown in a really, really little version. So no one could really work, work with it. Here you see some more uh, modern photos of this catacomb. And you see the first uh, hole in the ground, that is the tomb of Flavius Maximianus. And after the catacomb, had not so much space for more, more bodies, they um, made more holes or more tombs inside this catacomb and also in the Arcosolium of Flavius Maximianus. And that was also the problem because until today, I couldn't get an entrance in this catacomb because it's not any longer stable and it's too dangerous. And that's our, beside uh, some other photos a colleague sent it to me, the only photos which are now available about this uh, Arcosolium of Flavius Maximianus. 
And that is a better photo of him. You see uh, he's wearing a red tunic, which is quite rare, also based on this whole discussion how famous or how common was a uh, red tunic in the Roman army. And then you have on the left-hand side this little tree on, or uh, I can also say on the side of the dead, a tree without fruits and leaves. And he is wearing his official or uh, dress of representation with his gilded helmet, his shield, and his blue wrappings. But this depiction of Lake Roman soldier is really fascinating because this depiction shows us so many details which are comparable with other archaeological artifacts. Like, for example, this uh, helm type from Guna Pintelo in Takisa in Hungary, which shows the same eye, eyes in front of the helmet, also on the fresco which depicts Flavius Maximianus. And then, many, in many publications, there was the attempt to identify the shield depiction or the shield pattern, but um, in no attempt, there were many people, they were really close, like Graham Sumner, he already saw it, or uh, Uida Zarson, he also mentioned already a shield pattern which could be linked to the Notizia di Cicatum, but he couldn't see what is really uh, depicted on the shield of Flavius. And at the end, um, Roger Wilson and some other scholars explained that it's, it looked like a tree or a um, floral ornament or something else. But uh, if you have a look on the shield depictions inside the Notizia di Cicatum, there's not on one shield a depiction of a tree and that's made me suspicious. The first thing which um, is recognizable that is this uh, half horizontal moon with something inside. I'm not clear about this column and the globe on the column. That is only interpretation based on the photo you see on the left hand side. And then there's this depiction of um, fresco, which um, there's this depiction of the shield. And um, I um, had also, after I collected all the shield depictions, there are quite a lot of other shield depictions with uh, shield symbols or signs on it. And I, at the beginning, I not focused especially on this fresco from Zero Cruz, but at some point, I recognized we have a painting in color, we have an inscription to a tomb, and then I thought it would be possible, also based on the uh, preservation of this fresco, it should be possible to identify the shoot pattern. And then I put it on a light table and made some outlines. And um, after several attempts, also with Photoshop and Adobe Illustrator and other programs, I uh, saw what is depicted on this field. And i going back only for you, that everyone can see it. What I saw several years ago. We have here two literal creatures. I don't want to call them lion, also if they, are, uh, they have this color. We have two creatures with four legs, but overpainted uh, with the rim of the shield which are looking to this half moon on the upper part of the shield and between these two lines which are jumping away from each other is the shield post and the red stripe under the shield post has nothing to do with this little creature. And during the same night, I identified this uh, little creatures I had as first a view on all copies which were at this point available um, from the different copies of the Notizia Dignitatum and had a look what field could be similar to, to this shield pattern from this fresco. 
And here, again, a little a complete view. So, and now uh, here is a whole fresco. So, and then the first plate of shield patterns inside the Notizia di Cantatum from the Eastern Roman Empire shows this little shield pattern, which uh, is referring to the unit Martiari Iliodorus, which shows the two little creatures, um, a red line under the shield boss or the middle part of the shield, and then over the middle part of the shield, it shows a half moon, but with a cross -head. And if we have a look on all the various copies of the Notizia Dignitatum, we have a similar depiction in every copy. That means the color, the color scheme is similar. Also the creatures at some point, we have this little cross inside the moon. And this is really fascinating based on the long time of transmission history we have based on the Notizia Dignitato. And um, also that the fresco painter in Zyrakus used specific colors for this shield, which are also used in the different copies of the Notizia Dignitato. But there's another unit inside uh, the lists of the Notizia Dignitato, which called Martirari e Zenurus. And now we coming in the next slide to the inscription. That was the question about which unit we are talking. So talking, do we talking about the juniorus or the seniorus unit? And you see here, it, the stammer is not so clear as it is for the Martiari juniorus. You see, we have the creatures in the same orientation, but we have this little red line under the shield post is a bit wider. And then we have also some copies in which the creatures are missing or the half moon is missing, but not in one case, there's something inside the half moon. So, and based on this two field depictions, it was for me really important to get to know what we have for or even what we can read inside the inscription. Because the inscription after many decades was only two times mentioned because in every publication, everyone is using always the depiction of the slave Roman soldier, but no one had a look after the first publication and after a short publication written by Christian Nix in the 2000s that uh, there's uh, a preserved or transmitted transcription linked to this Arcosolium. And then I had a view on the first publication of this um, group, uh, written by Angelo in 1969. And uh, I, was, I, I saw as first in this publication that we have an inscription to this Arcosolium, then no one mentioned it. So, and this inscription uh, transmitted uh, the following text, this manibus Flavius Maximianus de numero, that means from the unit, is a, is a synonym for unit in this time, from the unit M MA, and after Angelo, there's space for seven letters, Wixit Anos, 21, he lived only 20 years, Carinus Frater Pentissimus Ficet, his love, I would translate it with his lovely brother that built this tomb or gave the order to build this tomb. So, and now during this whole night, I was really fascinated and I decided I have to go to Sicily. I need photos of the inscriptions. Is there any uh, color on this place where the seven letters are not any longer where not any longer reachable for Angelo. And um, I, I had to go to Sicily. Then now we are playing a little game. You all know the game Hangman. 
and um, it's it's quite hard to fill this unit name also based on the evidence we have from the Notitia Dignitatum, if we have a look on the field patterns from the fresco and the different copies, because even if we would not have photographs from the inscription, we have the problem of different spellings because we do not have in the, especially not only especially for the late Roman period, especially for the ancient period, we do not have a writing root. So, if you have a look on this um, chart, we have different spellings inside the Notitia Dignitatum, which are not following the same spelling, even for the same unit in different copies. Then we have epitaphs from Julia Concordia, Northern Italy, but it's not clear which unit, in which unit the buried soldiers served in because uh, many uh, epitaphs do not um, uh, do not um, mentioning the following type to juniors or seniors. And then even the ancient authors, which are mentioning the Matiari, but also without juniors and seniors, are using different spellings. So with this evidence, that is, there's not the possibility to find a solution for this uh, unit name inside the inscription of the Arcosurium of Flavius Maximianus. As first, I tried to do something with the published black and white photography. And I have to say, it's not so useful for this kind of question. If you know what to see inside the inscription, you can recognize some letters, but um, even if I now explain to you, you see in the second line, DE, N for a numero, and then you see MA, and then, but you see some really dark fields inside the inscription, which are, gave me the little chance that there should be in a color photo, some colored sections, which were still, uh, readable or seeable. And the only modern photo, and I have also to say, I don't want to say bad stuff about uh, other colleagues and especially about uh, foreign colleagues, but uh, no one took until today, only one good friend of mine, no one took until today a frontal photo of the inscription. I had to work as first only with fragments. But you can see here, that um, after the E, N, then you see in the second line, M, A, you see some little red fragments, and then you can recognize a A in the third uh, space. So that was the first attempt that there's much more possible as um, the reading of Angelo um, gave us as first. Here is a more, uh, here's a better look or yeah, of the same photo, which you can see as first MA, and then you have some little red fragments, and then you see uh, the third letter is A. And then I had a nice trip to Sicily, also to the monuments office to have a look on the excavation documents and reports in which I could also localize the Arcosolium and all those other things which were important. And they had a little Polaroid photography, which also showed the A. And then I do not show you, or I can't show you today because uh, it's this photography is not published and I promised my uh, friend to not publish his frontal photo of the inscription before I published it. But um, after this other new photograph, I could identify uh, two more letters between MA and the A I already recognized with the old photographs. And that brought me to the solution that, um, or yeah, for the uh, solution for this unit name, 
that uh, could be spelled in G numero M A T I. Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, T I is only preserved in little red fragments, and then I forget to mention it. On the new photo, I can't show you today. There's also a red line for R seeable, and that is the reason why I uh, reconstructed after the A uh, R, and then that would be the end for the unit name Marty Yariorum. And then I decided for the last three letters would 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 be free the shortcut for Yun because the brother Carinos gave so much attention or gave the order to the fresco painter to paint this specific shield on this arcosolium that. It's my opinion that also in to divide the Martiari, the Martiari in Junius and Zenurus from each other, also inside this inscription with the shortcut Jun for Junius. And that's just a little painting a good friend of mine uh, made for me and my PhD project, uh, Sasha Munyakov in which I wanted to show you this specific moment that we have the inscription, which are also mentioned inside the Notizia Dignitatum, with the shield pattern, which is also depicted inside the Notizia Dignitatum, and this um, order or this last proof or supervision the brother uh, Carinos um, gave to his brother that everyone should be painted in this kind of way, that even 1,600 years after we started with our research on the different copies of the Notizia Dignitatum, his brother was identifiable based on our copies we have of the Notizia Dignitatum and this fresco he ordered to be painted in Syracuse. And that changed also some kind of the dating of this aquasolium. I already explained to you the dating of the Notizia Dignitatum. And now, with this uh, comparison studying between the fresco and the Notizia Dignitatum, we have for the first time um, late Roman shield pattern, which is comparable to the Notizia Dignitatum and should be in this way also show us a unit which exists also based on the historical record we have because this unit is uh, not many times but uh, several times mentioned in ancient written sources and historical situation should be dated in the same period as the Notizia Dignitatum is, uh, is uh, made, but we do not know what has happened with the unit before and after the Notizia Dignitatum, but um, the Notizia Dignitatum is uh, for the historical record quite fascinating if we have a close look on the history of this unit. Ah, yeah, and that is um, one of my last uh, slides. That is uh, quite fascinating because the unit, the Martiarii Junioris, uh, or the Martiarii uh, after the Notizia Dignitatum and also after the ancient uh, written sources, are served during the whole late Roman period in the Eastern Roman army. And there can be also discuss the question what did the late Roman soldier in Sicily in the Western Roman Empire if he had to serve or served in the Eastern Roman Empire? Then he was under the command of the Magister Militum Presentalis. Uh, Second. So, because this uh, unit, the Martiari Junioris, or the Marti, sorry, I saying always Martiari Junioris, I mean, in this case, only the Martiari, because Amianus Marcellinus does not mention the nicknames Junioris or Senioris. The Martiari are several times mentioned, always together with the unit Lankiari. 
And for example, in autumn 361, they marched against the usurper Julian. In uh, 363, they were following Julian into his Persian campaign. In the second half of the fourth century, there's this presumed military re reform in which um, we think today this uh, uh, definition of juniors and seniors started, but we do not know until today what is the meaning of, meaning of it. On the 9th of August, 378, uh, the Matiyarii and again the Lankiyarii uh, joined the Battle of Adrianople, in which they could be totally destroyed or defeated. But later on, this unit is also mentioned inside the Notizeling Tatum, which gives us, us some idea that this uh, defeat at Adrianople was not so um, bad as we uh, think when we're following the explanations of Armianos Marcelinos. And then in 420, a decree of um, a decree inside the Codex Theodosianus mentioned a protection of harbors and coasts by numeri, which is quite fascinating because uh, Flavius Maximianus served in a numeri or a delegation or a little part of his mother unit, the Martiarii Juniorus. And this is mentioned in 420 but without any specific units. It's only, um, only a law, and we do not know how this law worked. But if we're following the date of this uh, fresco and um, yeah, this whole other issues, we are coming close to other events because if we're following the question, what does a late Roman soldier which served in the late Roman Eastern army in Sicily, uh, we have many events because some scholars after this Arcosolium where was discovered, they thought Sicily is such a boring place. There's nothing happened. Why should uh, a high member of the late Roman army which served in a, a light unit um, stay in Sicily? But there are many usurpers in Northern Africa and we have also the supply routes to Rome. And we have some usurpers which are dating also to the time in which Flavius Maximianus, uh, Flavius Maximianus could be died based on the art style of the fresco and the other issues I explained to you. But the main military actions which were which took place in Sicily during the Wonder Randall um, attacks from Northern Africa, in which Geyseric tried to conquer or to plunder the province of Sicily, would be too late for the dating of the tomb. I would be really happy if I could make a reconstruction that uh, Flavius Maximianus tried to defend Syracuse or other cities in Sicily, but it's from my point of view, based on the art style and the other stuff I explained to you, uh, not possible. But there's one, sorry, yeah, there's one interesting I have at last uh, to mention that I told you that the Martiarii inside the history of Amianus Marcellinus are always together with the Lankiarii. And there's one tomb, but this uh, tombstone only mentioning the name and the unit of a member of the Lankiarii, which was discovered, but it's now lost in the San Giovanni catacomb, close to the catacomb in which the Arcosolium of Flavius Maximianus is located. But this inscription is undateable and um, is now lost. And we have also several units inside the Notizia Dignitatum, which are, have the same name, Lankiarii, or in different spellings. And I don't want to put them together, but I wanted to show you this interesting case that we have also under the rare evidence of inscriptions of late Roman soldiers in Sicily, a second inscription of the late Roman soldier, which served in a unit which named Lankiari. So now I am coming to the end of my talk. So, whoop, yeah. Um, after I showed you all the stuff and we're starting 
now the discussion it's from my point of view and i don't want to i don't want to tell you lies or something else there is quite a lot of stuff around the pizza dignitatum calpolianso we do not know it was a gift for a high ranking emperor we do not know the purpose of this um, document or something it's the only thing and that is explained by a German scholar uh, named Ralf Schaaf. And he made a little theory or explanation that um, we have a richly illustrated codex with gilded pages. And there's only a poor group of people which would be happy if someone gave them a richly illustrated codex like, like this as a gift for an anniversary or something else. Then for quite a lot of other people, it's, it's a boring document only with lists and that this could be only some interest in high-ranking administration members or other people in this kind of field. And that is like this uh, little painting here made by Hermann Knackwurst, which shows uh, uh, um, gift of the uh, here codex uh, Justin Janos, uh, which could be in some case a similar case for the Notizia Dignitatum that, that someone ordered it in the archives of Rome to put all these notes of the Roman border and military stuff together. But even if it was a gift for someone, there they spent so much time to put all these notes together, like all the shield depictions, which are based on this little find. In Syracuse, this find from Syracuse can, can't represent a solution for all the depictions inside the Notizia di Cantato, but it's a, it's the first little step that we have one short depiction with bits to another, but it shows that uh, there is some there's there's some information until today inside the Notizia di Cantato with which we can work on, but. Um, it, it's really hard to get it, and uh, that needs more studies during the next years, um, as we already done it with many other ancient written sources. Yeah, and now I'm coming to my last uh, conclusion. Um, we have this all contemporary uh, painting at Syracuse. Then we have the first reliable analogy of a short picture from the Matisse de Picardon. We should all keep in mind the transmission history um, on which all these copies we are today dealing with it uh, based on. And then also this, I showed you during the first slide, this uh, little scene from the movie and the name of the rose, that uh, also the monks and copyists in the medieval monasteries, they tried, from my point of view, they tried to do their best to preserve this high value, the high value of this document. They were not at some points doing some crazy stuff or some little illustrations. We have in other medieval manuscripts with rabbits which are besieging castles and something else. They saw the value of this document beside many other ancient written sources which should be copied. Yeah, and uh, for some people, they already knew me, and uh, I wanted to say this last word. We organized, uh, as some of you know, in 2019, uh, a really large conference about the Nikita Dignitatum, but based now on the circumstances with the coronavirus, it takes a bit more time to publish the volume, unfortunately. And then even my PhD takes uh, some time. Um, I've done a lot. I'm not finished until today, but my PhD will come with quite a lot of explanations about the Notizia Dignitatum and uh, late Roman field depictions. And yeah, and now I would open the discussion round and I thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you, Marco. That was, uh, that was brilliant. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you for coming and talk to us. Um, I'm quite conscious of the time at the moment, so I've got a couple of questions in front of me. If we can yeah. jump straight into them, I'll just pick out one or two. We'll, uh, we'll see where we go. So, um, Alex Ills has asked whether the Nimbus in the Oxford and Parisian versions of the Shields of the Junior and Juniors could be um, due to copying the Eagle from Gospel books rather than the Natitia itself. 
Do you think that could be could be? Um, there, there are many cases possible. Even um, there's also the question that, but it's really hard from my point of view to explain or to find an evidence for it. Do we have for every copy only one painter? So there are also some uh, manuscripts and or some records about manuscripts are transmitted in which they um, divided a whole manuscript and gave it to seven copiers or to several copiers and everyone done his job and then they binded it again together. It could be could be anything then, I guess. Then, um, yeah. Susan Biddle has asked something sort of broadly along a, a similar theme. Really, is um, have you or anyone else considered to what extent the Roman shield pattern emblems may have evolved into European heraldic symbols? That's just a really uh, nice question. That's um, that was the dream of many people which worked on heraldic uh, symbolism. They uh, thought uh, during the end of the 18th century and the early 19th century that also some uh, late Roman army units, which were transferred during the end of the Roman Empire and war bands, would, could be like the basement for the eldest European royal families. And uh, that's, but that was an idea. I see, uh, I see no link to uh, the medieval uh, um, uh, shield patterns or family uh, signs. Yeah, that's, is, there's, a, there's a huge uh, time gap between the Notitia Dignitatum and this kind of symbolism. But uh, many people tried it or thought or they started their explanations with the Notitia Dignitatum. Uh, I've probably, probably got time to just squeeze one more question in, I think. Um, Steve Honeyset has asked whether the half moon symbol on some of the shields could be a galley with raised bows and a central mast rather than a half moon. And it is also uh, quite a lot of times really hard for me uh, to explain or what kind of vocabulary I have to choose if I'm talking about a shield. Mm -hmm. Because if I talking about uh, a, a sun and stars, I'm already deep inside the discussion with the sun god soul and other kind of stuff. But um, I using this kind of term only technically and not with a specific meaning based on the symbol. Because I even I even think that uh, that if we would have now in this discussion, a late Roman soldier, even he did not explain to us every sign which is depicted on the sh on, on all the shield. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, well, we're pretty pressed for time at this point, so I, I think we'll have to wrap up for the evening. But thank you, Marco, very much for, for coming and talking to us. It was a fascinating talk, and you, you've clearly done an awful lot of research, and I'm sure everyone at the Roman Army School wishes you all the best with your, your PhD, and we, uh, we all look forward to seeing it when it's published. <laughs> No, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, yeah, it was nice to see you and I hope uh, everyone enjoyed the lecture.